Media coverage provided by the CyberWire. Our popular daily cybersecurity news brief and daily podcast are online at thecyberwire.com. We are able to help extend the reach of the 2017 Women in Cybersecurity Conference keynotes thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. IBM. Silence and CyberSec Jobs. Hello, my name is Dulce Kaiser. I am a second semester freshman at Tennessee Tech. Welcome to the keynote uh, lunch and address, which is a panel discussion entitled, A Cyber Career Path Can Be As Unique As You. And so it is my pleasure to present our two panelists. Ms. Diane Miller is the Director of InfoSec Operations and Cyber Initiatives at Northrop Grunham Corporation, ensuring effective operational leadership for the information security functions of Northrop Grumman. Her leadership includes the design and execution of a com comprehensive approach to cyber security outreach, education, and public-private partnership for thought leadership in addressing national security challenges. Ms. Miller is a graduate of California State Polytech University at Pomoa and lives in Washington, D.C. General Linda Medler is a director um, is a director of IT security, chief information security officer for Raython Missile Systems. Brigadier General Linda Med R. Medler completed 30 years of active duty military service, retiring in 2014 from the United States Air Force. In her final position, she served as Director of Capabilities and Resource Integration, United States Cyber Command. During her career, she commanded units ranging in size from 140 to being responsible for, Air Force, for the Air Force's third largest installation with a workforce of 22,000. She deployed to Afghanistan in 2004 and also led a team of 150 airmen to provide humanitarian relief across the Mississippi Gulf Coast in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. And at the end of our panelist discussion, we will have a short Q&A session, so please hold your questions till then. All right, can you, okay, awesome, I can still be heard. Okay, so, ladies, give me a second. All right, so you've, uh, we've heard a short introduction about each of you. Would you please tell us more about who you are and your career path? Here we go. Here we go. Well, uh, good, good afternoon. And first of all, I would like to applaud all the sponsors for making today happen. And for you all out there that are participating, don't squander this great event. Get out there and network and, and meet new people every day. But, Beyond that, um, my career path is a little bit diverse, and so that's why people find it interesting to be, for me to share it. So um, I'm very proud to have come from a working class family. Uh, they valued hard work, they did not value education. And so I always worked, but I barely, barely graduated from high school. And um, so when I was 18 years old, I was running the county, uh, the printing press at the county extension office, making 90 bucks a week, and, I thought, and living at home. And I thought, you know, there has to be a little bit more to life than this. And so I um, had, had had an opportunity to go to uh, a graduation of a Marine Corps basic training. And I really identified with the patriotism and the discipline I saw at that graduation, and so I came home and told my father that I was joining the Marine Corps. And he kind of said, well, will you at least go talk to the Air Force? And I said, okay. So I went and talked to the Air Force, and I came back home, and I said, I'm joining the Marine Corps. <laughs> and so um, I spent my first Christmas away from home at 18 at Paris Island, South Carolina, and I had found my calling in life, I thought. Um, and so I uh, went in and went on, and I was an admin troop, that's what we could do back in the day. And um, I uh, got married and got pregnant, not necessarily in that order, but we'll leave that uh, for another discussion, and, um, and uh, gave birth to a wonderful son. Uh, at the time, uh, the Marine Corps had just been al allowed women to stay on active duty. 
And so because I enjoyed serving so much, I had applied for it and was permitted to stay on active duty. Um, however, there were no uniforms and there were no regulations. And so um, I was told at the three and a half week point that I needed to go back to work, that um, you know, if they wanted me to have a son, they would have issued me one. And it was time for me to go back to work. And, um, and so anyway, long, that part, uh, long story short, uh, it came a time where I couldn't be a great Marine and I couldn't be a mother and a wife. Um, luckily, I will have to say, I don't think we have to make those decisions anymore. And uh, so I got out and I cried the day I got out because I really uh, believed in serving our nation in uniform. And so I worked as a secretary, administrative assistant, I guess, um, for seven years, putting my uh, ex-husband through school. There's a lesson there as well um, about, uh, about that. And um, as I helped him with his homework, I realized this school stuff was not all that hard. And so, and that if I was going to get anywhere in life, I ought to really get a college degree. And so I decided to start going to school as my marriage was starting to unravel. And, um, and it really made me realize that I was going to be a single parent, but I really miss serving my country and miss serving in uniform. Um, but I was a single parent now of two children, and I uh, thought maybe my dad was a little wise when he told me to talk to the Air Force, so I decided after, you know, about 15 years to listen to him. And so I went and I talked to the Air Force. And I, uh, I wasn't given much of a chance to be accepted into officer training school. I was uh, 30 years old. I had two children and a single parent. And, but I had a 3.9 GPA and uh, 16 hours of computer programming and some math classes. And at the time, the Air Force, I, I was able to overcome being old and having kids by with my uh, degree. And so I applied to Air Force Officer Training School. Um, because of my Marine Corps discipline, I graduated number one in my class in Air Force Officer Training School. Um, I was like, OK, so you're just going to yell at me? I mean, that's not that bad. So. Um, and then 27 years later, I retired as a Brigadier General in the world's best Air Force and serving in uh, at United States Cyber Command. So, um, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So there's a, a, a lot of intervening things, but you get the gist. So let's see. Um, there was never a question in my family that I would go to college. I was the youngest of four. You were going to college. Every, that's just what we did. My, my dad was in the Air Force, so I was raised in a very kind of disciplined environment. And I knew from the time I was in fifth grade, I was going to major in forestry and conservation. And I was going to live in the middle of nowhere and look for forest fires or hug trees or something like that. So my freshman year, I took a class in a language no one here I'm sure knows of is Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I also took COBOL, so just a case. And, and I loved it. And I immediately said, I'm going that direction, and uh, decided to go to California State Polytechnic University, where they were putting out a model curriculum in computer information systems. And so uh, when I graduated from there, I went out to be a, a systems analyst. Um, and I really enjoyed that for a few years. Um, and I have always worked in the aerospace and defense business, and I'm um, passionate about the, the mission in defending our nation. And so that is just, um, you know, I'm sure I could do a million other things in cyber, but that's where I choose to be. And so in my uh, 32 years with uh, Northrop Grumman, I've had a real opportunity to do very different kinds of things. It's just that type of an organization where you can kind of follow your passion doing different kinds of things. So I started out in software engineering, software systems integration and test, and kind of a traditional path. Um, and then went into program management and then managing large portfolios, profit and loss portfolios, um, and always in defense and intelligence. And uh, about 2009, someone said, you know, how about if you combine your kind of computer information systems and your intelligence background and go into cyber? And so that's what I did, and, and um, it's been a whole lot of fun. And then in 2010, I was asked if I would lead this program called Cyber Patriot. And I said, what is that? And I already have a full-time job. <laughs> And so I said, sure, what the heck? And um, at that point, I saw an amazing 
need for educating and training our workforce and our youth in cyber, and that has been a part of my job. I never got to give up on the main part of my technical job, so I'm in corporate information security, protecting our global networks, which are pretty large in Northrop Grumman, and also responsible for our identity management and our corporate information security training and awareness and our strategy and lots of other things. So it's, it's been a real mix, um, real fun opportunities to do different things. So now I'm in corporate information security and also do our um, global cyber education and workforce. All right. So um, for Ms. Um, Miller, would you take a few minutes to explain to us, um, so you had just you had uh, explained to us what you do in your career. What I'm doing now. I, I, uh, so now, it's kind of an interesting role. I work for the Chief Information Security Officer and deal with identity management, how we credential and provision identities for all of our incoming employees and our, our suppliers, our third-party vendors, our suppliers, the government employees that are, um, work with us. Um, and so that's a part of it. Writing our strategy is a fascinating part of my job. Where do we go in information security when you look at the internal and external influencers of what we're going to do in information security? And then moving all of our things into a global um, reach. We have uh, facilities all over the, the globe and it's you know dealing with some really interesting international laws and, and those kinds of things. So it's pretty fascinating um, to learn something different every day. Um, and then the other part of my job, which is really, I think, more fun, more rewarding, and that's the global cyber education and workforce. Um, so I get to work a lot with students K through 20, um, and then into uh, career growth and things like that. So it's just a whole lot of fun. It's a real different, demanding kind of job. A lot of time on those red-eye flights, too. You know? <laughs> yeah. And for you, uh, General uh, Linda, um, could you also explain, uh, take a few minutes to explain what you do? Yes, yeah, so when I made the difficult decision to retire, um, I said I'm never going to work for a defense contractor. Um, so I work for Raytheon, and uh, we are a large defense contractor. And so, but I will tell you that um, I, it, I've had an interesting road uh, like the rest of my life. When I first retired, we knew we wanted to come to Tucson, Arizona because I'm a graduate, a proud graduate of the Eller School uh, with my MBA concentration in MIS, and then I was assigned here, and so we fell in love with Tucson. Um, and when I retired, I didn't think that there would be a whole lot of market for my skill set uh, here in Tucson, and so I stood up my own consulting business and was having a great time um, figuring out what does it mean to be a consultant and uh, running my own business and doing billing and all of those things I had never figured out how to do. And um, like all networks, uh, there had people I had served with on active duty that were now at Raytheon. And so they called and said, you know, we really need your skill set. Could you, would you mind coming and talking to us? And I, I humored them and said, sure, I'll come and talk to you. And uh, 14 months later, uh, we decided that there was a place for me at, at Raytheon. So I started out on the product side, trying to grow the cyber business. And then now I'm on the, um, the functional side where I'm the chief information security officer, director of IT security. Sum it up to say I try and keep the bad guys out and let the good guys do what they're supposed to do. So, all right. Um, so you each have over 30 years of experiment, experience and in the late 80s and early 90s, information technology didn't exist as it does today. What fascinating and rewarding experience helped propel you into the position that you have today? So, could you answer? Well, first of all, when you say we have 30 years, boy, it makes me feel really old. So I guess I, I guess that's the case. Um, but you know, it, to me, it's always the technology is on a fast pace, and I, I will grant you that. But I don't think the basic view of how you lead people and how you enable technology to whether it be the warfighters or your organization uh, is a whole lot different. And so I think that there's a, a, a lot of uh, change that has happened. 
I think the, the world is your oyster now in cyber, and what we decide cyber is, is really what you want it to be. Um, I would like to say if you're not really technically adept, but you understand potentially policy and ethics and, and how we can navigate this difficult world that we find ourselves in, there's a role for you in cyber. If you're uh, like the intelligence and cryptology environment, there's a role for you in that. If you like IT and setting up networks, there's certainly a role for you in that. And so uh, while the technology has moved at a rapid pace. I don't think the ba basic approach of, of being a leader in this challenging environment has changed a whole lot. We need really strong leaders that are willing to roll up their sleeves and, and get the job done. So, you, you know, what's really interesting is that when I went to cr college, you know, 100 years ago, there weren't that many females in my major. And unfortunately, I don't think there are still that many females in that major. So from that standpoint, not a lot has changed since the 80s. Um, and, but I agree with Linda, you know, it, it's kind of funny. When you look at the profession now and you look at the profession as it existed in the 80s, it was still just as important to build a network and to collaborate and to meet people that are doing the kinds of things that you're doing or could complement the kinds of things that you're doing. Always with an eye to what else is happening within my sphere of influence or the things that I'm interested in, what else can I do? And so in a lot of ways, the profession is the same as it was because there are still a mix of opportunities for females. Um, but it's a little bit different just in the, the innovation that exists and the technology that exists now. But still thinking back to it, it's a good solid profession where if you work hard and you collaborate, work well with others and keep an eye towards always improving your own skills, it's still a great profession. So that part hasn't changed. All right. Um, so, if you had to do your career over, is there anything that you'd do differently? Any specific lessons learned that would be, you know, good to share with us? I think if I had to do it over, I, there is, there's at least one thing I would do differently. Um, Growing up as a technical professional from a family, um, it was kind of very disciplined and strict. I was always focused on the mission, always focused on keep my head down, get the work done, meet the deadlines, put out you know phenomenal quality products and, and things like that. And I think if I were going to do it over again, I would still do all of that. But every once in a while, I would lift my head up <laughs> and look at what's happening around me and spend more time collaborating with coworkers, building up a network of mentors um, and advocates and sponsors um, because you don't have to do this career thing yourself. You can work with other people and leverage the skills and the lessons that they learned um, in order to move up. And I love mentoring um, other individuals who are coming, especially technical women in engineering fields that, are, that want to get into program management or into general management. Um, but I think I would have spent a little bit less time with my head down, hunkered down, getting the work done, and a little more time building the relationships. So, uh, Diane, I think you're this on? This on? This on? Yeah. No? Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Um, so, Diane, I think you're exactly right. Um, I, I, if I have the same lesson, I think, which is um, I would have spent more time um, networking with, with my peers in the Air Force and a little less time with my head down. Although I will say if somebody had asked me um, when I was in Marine Corps basic training, if I would have been doing what I was doing, I wouldn't say I had an exact plan ahead for my path. So it's hard to say what I would have done differently because it actually turned out pretty well and I didn't have a plan. And so I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think perhaps there's a lesson there is, you know, sometimes we want to overscript our life 
and we want, you know, we want to meet all these gates. You know, when I'm 21, I'm going to graduate with this, and when I'm 25, I'm going to have made it through my first job. I'm going to be in my second job. When I'm 28, I'm going to have my master's. Okay, well, it's great to have a plan. And I don't fault anybody to have plans, but know that your plan, we had a saying in the Air Force, a good plan only survives first encounter with the enemy, and you will be your own enemy. Uh, life will intervene in your plan. You'll meet somebody and your, your whole idea of what your plan was goes off the rails, or it won't. Um, but I think the time is great for us not to have to make those choices. Um, and so I, I would say that there isn't a whole lot I do different. I, I'm just, um, I, I am honored for the people that I have met, the people I've had an opportunity to work with. I can't believe I'm up here on the stage. Are you kidding me? I still feel like a little barefoot kid from Kentucky. So, you know, it's, it's all really, really good. Yeah. Um, is there any interesting places that you've uh, been taking with your career, like, is there anything like just out of there that you were never expecting to go to? Uh, Afghanistan wasn't high on my list of countries <laughs> I wanted to visit. Um, but, um, but, but having said that, what a wonderful opportunity um, to think about uh, going in the career field that I was get, I was in, and. Um, being at the time, as far as I know, the most senior female in country, wearing a uniform, packing my weapon, um, but the only woman at the table. Um, and there's cultural barriers that I think we need to realize you are not going to overcome that have been in place for 500 years. And so how do you work within those cultural barriers? And so I knew there were certain roles to help the Afghan security sector I couldn't fill. Um, but I could be a wise person to sit at the table, pick the choice, the moments that I had a discussion and what I talked about with, with uh, my counterparts in Afghanistan. And I think at the end of the day, um, I didn't accomplish as much as I would have liked. But I sort of felt that if one Afghan male went home that night and did not beat his wife because they had talked to me that I had done a good thing. And so um, Afghanistan would be one. The ability to do humanitarian relief on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, when you wear uniform, you usually serve overseas and you're not able to help fellow Americans directly. Um, you help them by your service uh, in other parts of the world. But Hurricane Katrina was so devastating, they had to talk, call on the Department of Defense to help. And so I was honored to be able to go and uh, prevent human suffering, save lives, and, uh, and, and give no orders, just go and look and see what needs to be done. And so those would rate right up there as well as being able to lead large installations and things like that, so. I've gone to, I've gone to some interesting places in my career. <laughs> But I, um, the nice thing, I, I lived in Los Angeles after I graduated from college for many years and then had an opportunity to move to Northern Virginia. And I think it's fascinating being in our nation's capital, in that whole area and being a part of that. It's just a, an amazing experience. But since I've been doing the cyber education and workforce um, part of my job, um, I, I lead the Cyber Patriot program for Northrop Grumman. We are the presenting sponsor. And that's allowed me to go all over the United States working with children and who are hopefully inspired to pursue uh, education and careers in cyber. So it's been really fun um, to work with state education organizations and governors on their, on their cyber programs. But a, a few years ago, about three years ago, um, our office in London asked me if I would bring Cyber Patriot to the UK. And so uh, with our Air Force Association partners who created Cyber Patriot, um, we started a program called Cyber Centurion, and it is an exact version of Cyber Patriot in the UK. And then uh, later that year, we took it to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and it's fascinating because I work with, um, only on the female campus at King Saud University, and women come from five different universities around Riyadh. And we get to teach a cyber work 
workshop kind of an arrangement. And then the best part is after the workshop, we do a competition against the men's campus. And of course, the women win. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so those have been some amazing areas. And um, later this year, I'll be taking the program to Australia and then hopefully South Korea and Japan. But what I find at every one of those engagements is there is so much um, talent among our young people to learn about cyber. They absorb it like little sponges. They're very open-minded to the possibilities, which is very exciting. And no matter where I am in the world, um, there's a real desire to be a part of something that's important. It's, it's important globally for us to have strong cyber defense for our own nation security, their nation security, and teaching them some new skills. And so I, I've kind of found a, a common thread through people around the world with that desire. Um, what a, um as uh, you work with your employees or hire new employees, are there any other skill sets, experiences, or characteristics which you'd find uh, to be more beneficial? I always look for job candidates that are open-minded. And it's open-minded to the possibilities. What's really challenging is when they say, tell me exactly what I would be doing if I hired in here every, you know, every day. What would I be doing? And um, sometimes I can tell you and sometimes I can't. Because what's important to me is we hire people based on the values and ethics of our company. Is this a person that we want to work with and have on our team every day? Because we can teach you skills. You know, if we want you to know Python, we'll teach you Python. But what we can't teach you is ethical behavior. You have it or you don't. And so what I look for, what's important to all of us in Northrop Grumman is a strong ethical and values base. And that you've, you've gone out and looked at the art of the possible. You've stretched yourself into learning new things. And I think one thing that's important to me is your willingness to say yes. Um, because when you say no, doors close. When you say yes, you don't know necessarily what's on the other side, but you're willing to take that chance. And, um, I, and I think that just leads to a more exciting career um, for people coming into the business, because you don't know what's possible. So it's pretty exciting, because there's always something different happening in the cyber profession. Diane, I would say um, that's exactly right. I, I think. Um, it's important to show initiative, um, and it's an important to realize that um, you may not always be doing the exact job or the exact task that makes you jump up in the morning and say, oh, yay, I cannot wait to go to work. There may be some mundane things that, that we, are, we ask you to do. I kind of think I've, I've heard this saying that said, if you work at something you love, you won't have to work a day at your, in your life. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. I worked real hard. That's why they call it work. You know, they don't call it play. They call it work. But I will tell you, if you're passionate about what that is, you won't be watching the clock every day. Um, you'll be immersed in what activity that we, we ask you to do. But there may be times when you have to read some mundane report, or you may have to write, even worse, you may have to write some mundane report. Whatever it is we give you to do, do your very best because you never know who's watching. You never know where you may excel at something. And, and it's really interesting to see when you do something you really don't have your heart into but you still give it your best, I think you learn more from that because it's you have to find that internal motivation to do that. And so I would say for, as I interview, I really look for that spark. You know, what could they do? Are they willing to say yes? Are they willing to do things, quote, outside of the box? I also think it's important to earn your right to the next role. Don't expect it to be given to you. And, um, and so you, some, you have to 
kind of have to grow up and pay your dues, if you will. And, and so I think that's what I look for, is people that are willing to go the extra mile. So uh, the next segment, we really want to have some question and answer with the audience. So we'll leave the last 10 minutes. There will be students running around for any of you who might have questions or comments that you want to make. So just raise your hands for those students. Just raise your hands, all right? <clears throat> so we'll leave the last 10, 15 minutes for you to interact with the panelist. Dan Manson, Cal Poly Pomona. The question is that I think that good organizations either hire talent or poach talent, and great organizations invest in talent development. Raytheon and Northrop Grumman invest in talent development. How do you measure the return on investment? That's a great question. We have, um, when I think of talent development, specifically um, within our cyber ranks, um, it, was, it became apparent to us that we needed to set up an entire career family and career ladder for cyber. And we did that about eight years ago. Um, so that you knew what the steps and the progression were in the career path and what you needed to do at each step to move forward. And um, we also have something called a Cyber Academy where we train our professional staff for certifications and things like that. I guess you could view this as a return on investment, but our retention rate is incredibly high in our cyber staff. And so our folks feel like they're being nurtured and developed and fed, not only through training, but we have rotation programs. We have specific mentoring programs. Um, when new employees hire into cyber, we have a, what we call a PDP program, which is a rotation program for a year and a half. So that employees get exposure to different kinds of roles. We have, you know, certainly leadership development programs and things like that. But I think an indicator would be our very, very high retention rate and the fact that we have far more people applying for roles in um, Northrop Grumman than we could possibly, you know, fill. We also have a lot of interest for our internship positions, and a lot of those are from our um, participation in the Cyber Patriot program. So we, we attract, and, and so far we're retrain, retaining. Yeah, I, I would like to add it's really about what value that you bring into the organization and how you're growing the business. And so, again, I, I started off on the business side, um, growing the business for Raytheon. And I think at the end of the day, we do some really important things for our warfighters. And um, why I'm there is to make sure that they continue, our workforce can continue to do those important things. And as long as our sales grow and our share uh, price uh, goes high and uh, our board of directors are happy and our shareholders are happy, I've provided value. But I do think a key measurement, uh, like Diane said, is retention. And we also are proud of our retention rates, and we have a, a, a great program for growing uh, the workforce from within. Um, oh. Hi, over there. Hey, I'm Lisa LaFleur. I'm from Raytheon. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we, they, they say that we all stand on the shoulders of giants, and I'd like to thank both of you for being here, because you're definitely some of the giants, and there's so many people in here who are going to realize, are going to have better careers because of the work that you ladies have done. I'd like to know what giants, you know, what are your, who are your role models that have, that have kind of, you know, whose shoulders are, your sta are you standing on? Oh, so, you know, um, the list is too long for me to, to call out here. But I would have to say it's my parents who gave me a work ethic and an undying patriotism for my country that gave me a guiding light, even though my path was very diverse to get where I, I achieved uh, in my career. And then um, my husband. So my husband is a, it was military as well. Um, he's the one that I really think is, should be up here and not me. He had. 200 combat missions over Vietnam and um, four distinguished flying medals and um, 17 air medals in the F-4 and um, walked away from it and many others didn't. And so those, those people, of course, I have to talk about my four children. 
I have uh, four wonderful children, eight wonderful grandchildren, and they motivate me every day to come out here and protect our country because I want it better for them. On the professional side, the, the list is too long, actually, and, and I'd be remiss if I called out anybody. So I'll call out groups of people. My enlisted force, which is, think of it as your entry junior force if you're not familiar with the military, who did what I asked them to do each and every day. Um, and, and achieved the mission beyond what I ever thought that they could do. The senior enlisted force that are really the folks that, that put the power behind our military forces. And then our senior officers who always have vision. Um, there's a lot on their plate. They have to deal with a lot of things, the budget and cost trade-offs on what we can do and what we can't do, being high among them. So I think those three categories, I would say. But it has to start with family for me. Absolutely. I, I think we'll take the last question, if we could. And well, can Diane answer? Oh, well, Linda. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so we'll I, I, I agree with first. Linda. It really does start with the foundation, you know, that you kind of, your parents instilled in you. Um, and it's funny because I've been in Northrop Grumman for so long, you know, 32 years, that there are a lot of women who moved into the executive ranks um, ahead of me and in all different walks of life, so whether it's attorneys or in human resources or where. Um, and I always look at them for inspiration. I also think as I'm out and working with um, leaders in our government, whether it's federal or state, there are amazing people out there who have achieved so much and have so much passion about what their mission is and what they contribute that they inspire me all the time. But I, I think it's probably more the children that I work with all the time who are so excited when the little bell goes off because they found a vulnerability in their virtual machine image. You know, that's when it's really fun. Um, and so next week is we're doing the Cyber Patriot 9 National Finals Competition, and there's 28 teams of children, middle school to high school, competing. That's the inspiration. And then I guess last one. Hi. My question is, what advice would you give the graduates, these women today getting out of college and actually pursuing their career in trying to get a job with any one of y'all's organization? Well, I had an opportunity earlier today to talk to the awesome uh, Navy midshipmen and the Air Army cadets that are here, and, and I'll tell you sort of what I told them. And um, th my first piece of advice is to forget finding balance in your life, because it doesn't exist. You'll find balance when you die. And so um, I think that as your life goes through, you will make choices throughout your life that will either be for your family or for your career. And, and something will always be out of kilter, but how do you find the ability to make those wise choices? So I, my advice to the workforce here, and, and I don't think it's unique, I'm gonna be honest, I don't think those choices about balance are unique to women. I, I do see my workforce and, and my male counterparts have those same choices about what, you know, what do they do or what do they don't do as they try and go on business trips versus missing, a, you know, a game or something like that that their kids are involved in. And so, and then my other piece of advice I think I already gave, but I'll reiterate it, and that is don't oversubscribe your life. I mean, don't try um, and have your life move by so fast. Pretty soon you'll be old like me sitting up here and wondering where it all went. So just go, enjoy the ride because no matter how you think, I, this is my personal opinion, no matter how you think your life is going to turn out, it ain't going to turn out like that. And so just enjoy the ride. It's a blast. And then be flexible along the way and realize that you will, sometimes the barriers that are in your way are ones you've put there, not ones that have been put there by others in the choices that you've made. So that would be my, doesn't have anything to do with technology, you'll notice, as more about being a human. So I guess um, my advice would be, as you're looking for your first job out of college, is be open-minded to the possibilities. You don't yet, you don't know what you don't know. 
And so when you go on a job interview, you're hearing maybe about the immediate positions that are available. But find something that feels right. It feels like you're going to have the opportunity to grow where you want to grow. That first job is not going to kill you if it turns out a year later that it wasn't the right one. Um, but I, I, I don't know, my gut instincts usually work for me. Um, but I, I would say be open-minded to the possibilities um, and, and follow your passion. Uh, you, you just follow your passion and you'll do well. I think that's all the time we have. We have a tech session starting from 2.15. Uh, we have two small gifts, and we'll take some pictures in the front. So let's thank the panelists and the moderator again. Mm -hmm.